we go. Oh, folks are filing in. Great. All right, it's 11 o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm Megan Coelho. I'm the president of Advice Chaser. Um, we're bringing you this webinar today with Dave Zagel, who's a CPA and CFP in St. Louis. Um, just a little bit of background about Advice Chaser. We're focused on financial education, and I'm making sure that everyday folks have access to ethical, high-quality financial guidance from skilled and experienced professionals. Um, we're really excited to bring you this lunch hour educational presentation about um, what you need to know about taxes and investments in retirement. Um, just a quick housekeeping note, attendees are muted, but we do encourage you to ask questions using that chat box um, that comes directly to the panelists so we can get those answered for you. Um, and we do want this experience to be as, as helpful as possible, so don't hesitate to ask for clarification or expansion on the material, and um, Dave will answer those after his presentation. Um, David is a lifelong resident of St. Louis. He has extensive experience with tax and investment planning. Um, he has a master's degree in accounting from St. Louis University and is a certified public accountant. He did spend the first 15 years of his career in advanced accounting roles and then decided to follow his passion, which is helping people to plan their futures. Dave takes uh, great pride in guiding investors through the sticky wickets of a global view of their finances and their goals for the future. So Dave, I'll let you take it from here. Great, thank you, Megan, and welcome everybody. My name is Dave Zagel, as Megan mentioned, and we're going to cover how you in retirement can really protect your investments and have them grow, and then also how to best minimize your taxes in retirement. So we're not talking about necessarily minimizing them right now or the next two or three years, we want to look at the whole picture of your retirement and say, okay, how can we minimize taxes over that time period? So I think you'll get a lot out of this. And I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes. I'm going to try to keep it to 30 minutes. And then we'll have lots of time after that for a question and answer session. As Megan mentioned, please put any questions you have in the chat and we'll answer them after I get done going through the presentation. That way we're not stopping and starting. But I still want to give you guys plenty of time to ask questions and, and have them answered. So to be more specific on today's topics, we're going to talk about navigating some market volatility. Obviously, 2020, we had plenty of that. And even going into 2021, we're seeing some volatility. It's smoothed out a little bit, but we're still going to talk about how to navigate ups and downs of the market. In particular, how do you do that in retirement? And we're going to talk about retirement plan rule changes, and we're going to focus in on just two changes in particular that are most applicable to retirees. Next, we'll discuss the top way to pay less tax, and then we'll talk about the top three retirement mistakes that we see and how to avoid them. So a little bit more about me. As Megan mentioned, I'm a lifelong uh, St. Louis resident. I have a family, three kids. I need to update this picture because it's a about two years old now, this is pre-COVID. Uh, I do have a background in accounting and have a thorough understanding of investments and taxes. I am the co-owner of CW, CWOs for Hire. We also own a CPA firm called CPAs for Hire. CWOs for Hire is 100% fiduciary. And the reason I mention that is because we don't accept any payments from 
anybody except our clients. We don't get commissions from anybody, no outside compensation at all. The reason I say that for this presentation is because there is no sales pitch at the end. This is purely informational. This is for you. So please consume it. If you want our help after that, you can reach out and let us know. Uh, and you can certainly talk through Megan as well. They, they really help establish a lot of these relationships for us. Uh, but this is for you. There is no sales pitch at the end. Say, buy here and you get this deal. Nothing. It's, this is all for you. So enjoy. Ask questions along the way. Okay. First thing we'll talk about is volatility in retirement. Markets do recover. And you always hear, okay, uh, be patient. The market recovers. Don't worry if it goes down. And for a lot of people, that's true, especially if you're in your 30s and 40s. Yes, you have maybe 20, 30, 40 years before you even need to touch your retirement account. So if the market goes up and down, not a big deal, stay invested. The key though is in retirement, you may not have as long of a time horizon. So timing does matter in the long term. It may not matter in the short term, for example, in 2020, we saw a huge drop in the market, really one of the quickest, sharpest drops we've ever seen. But really, it's recovered since then. So if you're worried about that drop and how it plays into this year, not really any big deal. You know, we saw a, <laughs> it was really traumatic, obviously, with having the virus and having that market drop. But in the end, the market recovered and hopefully we're recovering from this virus in the near future. But in the meantime, the market did recover and is well on its way. Uh, to a path likely higher. But the point in all this is timing does matter when it comes to retirement. Because if you were sitting here in 2008 and you just retired, well, the market took a huge hit in 2008, 2009. It started to recover a little bit in 2010 and beyond. But if you retired in 2008 and promptly saw your investments get hammered, that wasn't a great time for you. And I know a lot of people back during that time frame, saw their investments could cut in half. That's awful when you're starting retirement. So retirement, their timing does matter, and that's why protection is needed. When you hear about protection on investments, though, people typically run to things like annuities. I don't have any hatred towards annuities, but I feel that there is a better way. And I'm going to explain exactly how we use protection when we talk about how we look at putting investment portfolios together. But just understand that protection is needed because timing matters in retirement if you tried to retire again at 2008 or 1998 or 1999 before two pretty substantial market crashes where it took the better part of, uh, in one case, seven, eight years, and in another case, five or six years for the market to fully recover. Plus, if you're in retirement, you're pulling money out to use for income. You don't get the benefit, the full benefit of that recovery. So timing does matter, protection is needed. So just keep that in mind as you're going through retirement. And as we talk about how we actually put protection on retirement accounts. So how do we handle investments and how do I recommend other people do the same? This has served us well, uh, despite all the craziness of 2020, we had fantastic investment returns overall for our clients. And this is exactly how we did it. You start with a foundation of low cost index funds and exchange traded funds. That's what ETF stands for. These are easy to get. Uh, you can find them on Schwab, Vanguard, lots of different companies have these low cost funds. These give you plenty of diversification with still having low cost access to the market. What we do then is we add in stocks that we know very well on top of that. So individual companies, and a lot of that just comes from my background as an accountant and understanding companies, but even those that don't have an accounting background, if you're willing to put in the time and the effort to thoroughly research a company, you can invest in individual stocks and make a lot of money along the way. So I recommend that people do that if they have the time to do it. If not, get help, you know, get my help, get somebody's help to actually do that because it's a great way to make money in addition to owning the low cost index funds and ETFs. The third stool that we 
use to support our uh, investment portfolios here are what's called buying puts. This is actually using option contracts, which gets a little bit complex, but it doesn't have to. You can buy calls, which are betting that the market will go higher, or you can buy puts, betting that the market will go lower. So what we do for our clients that's worked well, and I've seen other people do this also, is you can own those index funds and ETFs and those individual stocks, but then take a very small piece of your account, very small. It doesn't have to be a ton, otherwise this gets too expensive. But take a very small piece and buy puts. That is effectively your insurance in case the market crashes quickly. We saw this early in 2020 when the market took a big hit. Those puts that you bought to bet against the market really go up in value very quickly. And that's happening while your investments are declining. So what happens is you have that nice little cushion in there to offset the decline. Plus, after the market has gone down a lot, you can sell those puts and you get cash to then invest while the market is low. It's a great way to be a little bit tactical, but you can have these puts on all the time. Uh, ideally, actually, the puts become worthless because the market keeps going up. But in certain situations, if the market does drop sharply, you have that insurance piece sitting on there. And the reason I recommend doing this strategy versus an, an annuity type strategy is an annuity will still get you some level of insurance because there's an insurance company bearing the risk. But what you're often not allowed to do is be very aggressive with the investments themselves because the insurance company limits how aggressive you can be because they're on the hook for it. They don't want to take on all that risk. So it's really a, a risk mitigation strategy for them as well. In this situation, if you're owning stocks, low cost funds, ETFs, and you use this little piece of puts, you can still get a lot of the market upside while having that protection, okay? Um, a question we always get on this, and this may come up in the Q&A session is, well, if you're worried about the stock dropping significantly, why not just move it all to cash and wait? That always sounds great, I've never seen somebody do it successfully on a consistent basis. I've seen people get it right at different points in time, and that's awesome. But it's very difficult to know exactly when to go all to cash and exactly when to get back in the market. I've, like I said, never seen somebody that can do it. And in fact, to further that point, you also have to consider an opportunity cost. What if you pull that money out and go to cash and the market continues to ride higher. If you think about it, that, that high, that the market going higher, you missing out on that is just as bad as if the market drops. Either way, you're still losing out on money. So don't just go all out of the market, have some form of insurance like the puts that we are talking about. Uh, that way, if the market does drop sh sharply, you're still protected, but you can stay in the market as it continues to go higher. If you have any questions on that, I'm happy to go over that in the Q&A afterwards here. Our second topic is retirement plan rule changes. And I love this picture because as an accountant and financial planner, this is what 2020 and even 2019 and 2021 have felt like. Lots and lots of different rules and regulations. We had uh, the SECURE Act, we've had stimulus bills, we've had all sorts of stuff. We are not going to go over all that. We want to focus on two things that are going to be applicable in retirement. The first one is that the RMD age is now age 72. So let's back up on RMDs. RMD stands for Required Minimum Distribution. It used to be that when you reached the age 70 and a half, you had to start taking money out of traditional IRAs. And the reason is you got a tax break when you put the money into the traditional IRA or the traditional 401k. Now the government wants their tax money. So you have to start taking some of that out. They raised that age from 70 and a half to 72. So it gave everybody an extra year and a half to leave that money in there if they don't need it and continue to let it accumulate. A key point here that we're going to touch on also later is that Roth IRAs 
are not subject to required distributions. Okay, so just keep that in mind. This is only for traditional IRAs and traditional 401ks where you have to take the money out starting at age 72. The second big, big rule change really deals more with your beneficiaries. So this is when you die, the people that get the money, what happens to them from a tax perspective? What's happened recently is that the stretch IRA has been eliminated. What the stretch IRA used to be is if somebody inherited your traditional IRA, they had to take required distributions, but it was spread out over their lifetime. So if somebody inherits an IRA at say age 50, their life expectancy might be you know, 35 years or so based on the government tables. Well, their required distribution in that first couple of years is very small. So the tax hit to them wasn't all that big of a deal. They get to stretch this out over the rest of their life. Now, there is no more stretch IRA. They are required to take the money out of the IRA over a 10 year period. That's all they get. So if you die and leave somebody a million dollars, that's great, they get a million dollars, but they're gonna have to take that million dollars of income and be taxed on it in that 10 year period. Initially, that might not sound like a huge deal, but if you consider, for example, somebody in their 50s or somebody even in their 60s, if they're still working, they're going to be paying tax on the income that they make from working, plus whatever they have to pull out from the IRA. So what they have to pull out from the IRA is going to be likely at much higher tax rates because their total income is going to be so much larger. So just something to think about from a planning perspective, and we're going to touch on another reason uh, why to plan out your taxes for the long term here. But just keep that in mind that your beneficiaries can no longer stretch this out over their entire lifetime. They have to take it over just a 10 year period. Okay. How to pay less in the long term. I'm going to say something that's very counterintuitive to the way a lot of people think about tax planning. Because I'm a CPA and people are used to going to their CPA and saying, okay, how can I reduce my taxes? And they'll go through some strategies on, all right, what's your tax bracket this year? How do we bring that down into this tax bracket? And those are all good things. But I'm going to say something very counterintuitive in order to save you money on taxes over the long term. And that is this, pay your taxes now. Why do I say that? We have the lowest tax rates that we've had in the past 80 years, and they're not going any lower. In fact, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was enacted a couple of years ago is set to expire on January 1st of 2026. What that means is even if Congress does absolutely nothing, all of the tax breaks that we got a couple of years ago expire automatically. And truth be told, some of them are phasing out even before that. But for practical purposes, the ones that apply to most people, those expire January 1st, 2026. So we have five years at the most of these lower tax rates. We don't know what Congress will do between now and 2026. I don't have a crystal ball on that. I don't even have a guess. I think it's anybody's guess as to what Congress decides to do with taxes. But just know that at the most right now, we have five years to take advantage of these lower tax rates. The other reason is, and if you've been watching the news, you may have seen that we have a very high level of national debt. And this slide's even a little bit outdated. It's, it's well over 27 trillion now. And you might see different numbers thrown out there and I'm not gonna debate the numbers. I'm, I'm gonna try to put this in context and really get you to understand why I feel this is an issue. So right here, we're showing about 26 and a half, it's really over 27 trillion of national debt. And that just continues to grow. Each year, the federal government and just over $3 trillion of tax receipts. So if you think about this, they have 27 trillion of debt. They take in 3 trillion of year just in receipts. 
picture that for yourself. Picture having, take your income and multiply that by nine, and that's how much debt you have. Most people would look at that and go, ah, uh, that's not going to work. So the point in all this is that we have this debt. It's going to be an issue one way or another. Either we're going to have higher taxes or lower spending or both, or we're going to have a lot of inflation that helps pay for the debt because it makes the dollars worth less. But in either case, we're going to have to deal with this at some point in the future, one way or another. Probably the most likely scenario is higher tax rates. Again, no crystal ball here. I don't know how high they're going to go. But the point is when we're looking at a full retirement time frame, the reason I stress paying taxes now is because most people will look at this year's tax return and just say, well, how do I decrease that? That might not be the best answer. For some, it might. There are situations where uh, there absolutely makes sense to decrease your taxes this year, and I can go over those in the Q&A if you'd like. But for most people, it's really important to look at the long term and say, okay, I might wind up paying taxes now, and that's okay, because I know that over the next 20 years, it's going to decrease my burden for taxes by a whole lot more. And we'll talk about how to do that. The other problem, which I won't dive into too much detail on, because I feel like I feel like this gets used as a scare tactic a lot, and it really shouldn't be. But Social Security is struggling, and there's going to have to be some changes in order to shore it up. They did this in the early 1980s as well. They made changes. Um, they kept it going. Um, so there's just going to have to be some changes. It's going to either come in raising the retirement age, increasing the taxes or decreasing the benefits or some combination of those. Uh, so, but, but in either case, the, the taxes for that are likely to go up. So whether that comes from uh, some combination of the social security tax paid by employees or employers or some sort of subsidy from the income tax, we don't know. But I put this out there just so that people understand that this is now a problem again that our country will have to deal with just as we did uh, in the early 1980s. So just another thing to add to the list on why I feel it's important to focus not only on how do I save taxes now, but how do I save it over the long term? Okay. A potential solution, and I say potential because like I said, it's not 100% for everybody, but for most people, we're finding this is a great solution, especially when we run the retirement plan for uh, for the client, we show them, all right, here's your current, here's what happens if we convert these funds over to a Roth IRA, and they go, oh, wow, it's you know, hundreds of thousands, or in some cases, I've seen it a million or more difference in the amount of assets that they have uh, at the end of retirement. So what is a conversion over to a Roth IRA? It is simply taking some of your traditional IRA or traditional 401k transferring it to a Roth IRA and paying taxes on that in the year you make the transfer. So this is the key point. Most people will not do this all at once because if you do it all at once, you could push yourself into higher tax brackets and that completely negates the whole point of utilizing lower tax rates that we have now. So most of the time we see people do little pieces over time to move that money from the traditional IRA to the Roth IRA. And by doing it in little pieces, you're still paying relatively low tax rates on those amounts that you are transferring. And then you have them in a Roth IRA bucket that will never be taxed again. So remember to circle back a traditional IRA, you got a tax deduction when you put the money in. So you are going to get taxed when you take it out in retirement. With the Roth IRA, you do not get any tax benefit for putting the money in, but when you use the money in retirement, it will have grown and grown and grown, and you don't have to pay taxes when you take it out. So that's the reason for moving it from a traditional IRA over time in smaller chunks and getting it to a Roth IRA so that when you need the money, it's not being taxed. So we, I can give you lots of examples of clients that we're doing this for, um, but I'll give you one. So we have a client who, a uh, very, uh, very simple lifestyle and 
they were able to retire a little bit earlier in their early 60s. And we sat down and we said, okay, well, you've got this, you've got a pension, which is pretty rare these days, but they have a pension and they have a traditional IRA. And we showed them, okay, well, based on your income need, based on how much you're getting from your pension, we can take your IRA and start converting it now. And by the time you get to where you're required to take distributions, you won't have any traditional IRA left. And in fact, we're going to move this money over to the Roth and you're only going to pay 12% federal tax on it. And all of these years, they're going to have some state tax as well. A 12% federal tax is extremely low. And we're just doing this each and every year, converting over a piece very steadily to get it to where they're all in a Roth IRA. So then once they get into their 70s, they'll have their social security and their pension. And the social security won't be taxed that much because they won't have much ta other taxable income coming in. And they'll be able to take all of their Roth money out completely tax free. So what we've done is we've taken the burden off of, oh my gosh, what if taxes are significantly higher later? How much am I going to have to pay? That burden will be completely gone. They'll say, I got social security, I got pension income, I'm set, I get the rest from a Roth IRA that's not taxed. And that is an ideal situation. Not everybody can get there to where they fully convert everything over, and that's okay. But that is an ideal situation to be in where you don't have to worry about the what if of extra taxes in the future. You can say, I have this much money, let's focus on the investments and on my health and on my lifestyle and just relax a little bit, okay? So what are the benefits of a Roth conversion? Again, we talked about the fact that the distributions from the Roth are tax-free. You're not required to take any distributions from a Roth IRA. Plus, remember we talked about the stretch IRA before, where your beneficiaries only have 10 years over which to take out the traditional IRA and get taxed on it? If it's a Roth IRA, your beneficiaries, the people that inherit the money, don't pay any tax. It's all tax-free to them too. So this not only benefits you, but this benefits the people that you leave money behind too, uh, if in fact that winds up being the case that you leave money behind. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through this one in detail, but I will discuss why it's here. So a lot of times we think of tax planning and a lot of people don't think of, okay, how does this change if if my spouse dies. It's an awful thought, but it's something that we have to consider for tax planning. What you have to understand is that if a spouse passes away, you go from married filing jointly tax rates down to single tax rates. And I say down to single, but that's not a good thing because what happens is you effectively take the tax brackets and cut them in half. So it raises the amount of tax that you have to pay. So typically when a spouse passes away, obviously there will be changes to your social security benefits because one of those benefits will drop off and depending on which spouse it is, uh, your benefits might stay the same uh, or they might increase, but either way, you're gonna lose one of those two spousal benefits. But really, if you're already in a period where you have to take required minimum distributions, that doesn't change. So now you're in higher tax brackets being single and you've only dropped off the income from social security for one person. From a cash flow perspective for you, that might still be fine. That might still leave you in a good place. But now often what you'll find is that even though your income decreased by that social security piece that dropped, you now pay more in taxes because your tax brackets changed from married filing jointly to single. So that is just yet another reason to try to move this money over into a Roth IRA over time so that if you get to this point, you don't have to worry about any of that. It's all in a non-taxable bucket then, and you're not going to get hit with higher tax rates because you went from married filing jointly to single. Okay. So with all that being said, again, I'm kind of skipping over the specific example just in the interest of time because I want to get to questions 
as people have them, is let's talk about the top three mistakes that we see in retirement. The first is not considering tax implications. And we've seen some, just some awful instances of this. Um, I'll give one example. We were working with a client where um, we were just doing their tax returns. So this is on the, the accounting side. We're just doing their tax returns. And they, were, they had somebody else they were using for a financial planner and um, they needed some money. So they decided that they were going to sell their rental property. Well, I won't go into every detail, but it was short for short version is that was an awful idea. So, and they just hadn't, they hadn't really contacted anybody to think about the tax implications of, okay, when I sell a rental property, what's the tax going to be on that? In their mind, they had actually paid off the loan on that. So they thought, well, it's debt free. Um, you know, We've paid all our taxes because we paid off the loan. Well, that was, it was just a wrong way of thinking about it. They wound up getting hit with a huge tax bill because it was taking some income that they had from working because uh, they were still doing a little bit of part-time work. They combined that with their money they took out of their IRA. And then they combined that with the extra income from selling the rental property. It was a disaster from a tax perspective for them. So always, 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 whenever you're doing, making any changes, whether you're, uh, selling something, you know, please make sure that you consider the tax implications. And if you don't know it, that's totally fine, but just make sure you, that you reach out to a CPA that does so they can guide you through it. It's, you know, paying a little bit for a CPA to review everything is far less costly than making a big mistake in taxes because government doesn't let you off the hook, unfortunately. They don't let you undo what you did. Second mistake that we see is not having protection. We talked about this at the very top of the presentation on how we do it, how we use puts to protect retirement funds. One, it just helps to increase your rate of return, but it also just increases your level of sanity when the stock market drops and you can look at it and go, okay, that's not bad. <laughs> that's, this is doable. And then it bounces back. So please have some form of protection on your retirement funds. And, I'll, I'll just state it very clearly in that I don't understand why more people don't have this, because if you think about it, you have protection on every other major asset in your life. If you have a house, you have insurance, uh, most likely. <laughs> if you have a car, you're required to have insurance, even just in case you get in an accident and injure somebody. Um, if you own a boat, you have insurance. I mean, you can go on the list if you were a lot of people have life insurance, you have disability insurance, uh, all these major assets have some component of insurance tied to them because it's gonna be a major, major impact to you if it gets lost. If your house burns down, that's gonna be a huge financial mess for you. Well, the same thing applies to your retirement money that you've spent all this time and effort to build up. Have some protection on it. So if we do see a market drop 40, 50%, you're not going, oh my goodness, like. <laughs> What do I do now? I'm pulling money out for retirement. How is this going to work? Have some protection. It'll just give you a, not only will it give you better results, you'll have just a great peace of mind knowing that it's going to be there for you. And then lastly, the third mistake that we see is not getting a fresh set of eyes. Uh, we're all guilty of this being humans. We kind of just keep doing what we've been doing. Um, I always recommend, if nothing else, just get a second opinion. <laughs> just so that way it's not you, because you're in the details all the time. Um, even as a business owner, I'll bounce ideas off people on you know what I'm doing in business, just because it's, it's hard for me to see an outside perspective of what somebody might view. You know, if I put out something from a, an ad for marketing, you know, I might think it's great, but somebody outside the business might say, I don't even know what you're saying. Like, what, what is this thing? You know, and it's good to get that perspective of, okay, I, I, I understand it because I'm in the middle of it all the time, but it might not make sense to somebody else. In the same way, I recommend the people who are used to doing the same thing all the time, that same thing might be just fine, but at least confirm that. Or if it's not fine, uh, then you'll have an understanding of why not and what adjustments to make. Okay, so that is all I was going to present on. We actually kept it to almost 30 minutes, which was, uh, I'm pretty proud of myself for that. That's hard to do with all that material, but I want to make sure that uh, we have time for these questions. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, 
let Megan take over and let me know what questions we have. Wonderful. Thank you. So let's see, we have a few questions about the, um, the RAA conversions. Mm -hmm. um, Great. So somebody mentioned, oops, one just popped up and it moved my screen. Um, somebody just mentioned that there are income limits um, on Roth IRAs, um, which might make it not feasible for some people. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yes, yes, that is a great question and something that's good to clarify. Mm -hmm. So there is an income limit on contributing to a Roth IRA. There is not an income limit on converting to a Roth IRA. So it's two different things that it's a great question. It's important to distinguish between just directly contributing to a Roth IRA, which there are income limits, versus converting, which there are not income limits. So great question. The only thing that you have to keep in mind on when you're talking about income and doing the conversions is like we talked about, you'll make sure that you're not converting so much that it bumps you into a really high tax bracket because that completely defeats the purpose. It's a matter of looking out and saying, okay, am I it? Do I have a good, do I have a proper amount of income being reported this year to still take advantage of the tax brackets? If not, will I at some point in the future? And we should plan on conversions at that point. So great question. Got it. So kind of a related question is, um, you know, would it make sense um, based on what you're describing for people to just, as they're accumulating wealth, to start in a Roth IRA instead of a regular IRA? Yes, very much. And a lot of that, again, is going to depend on what tax brackets you're in. But as long as you're not in a super high tax bracket, yes, we've been recommending a lot of people focus on the Roth portion, whether it's a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k. Uh, because, for example, if you're in a 401k plan where the employer is giving you a match, if you put money into a Roth IRA, or excuse me, the Roth 401k, that is going to be in a Roth account. But any money that your employer puts in as a match is going to be in a traditional bucket. So you're going to have two different buckets still, but it's going to be worthwhile to focus more on a Roth IRA. Uh, that way, again, you just don't have to worry about higher taxes in the future. Got it. Got it. Um, let's see. How is a Roth IRA taxed if left to a beneficiary? Will they have? Will they still have to pay income taxes on that as well? Yep. Like good question. A little bit. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and the answer is no tax, which is that's the huge benefit. Is once it's in a Roth IRA, there is no tax. There are some special rules on the Roth IRA it has to be in existence for five years, and there's a lot of details there. But in general. Um, if it's in a Roth IRA, it is not going to be taxed when you take the money out. So uh, that's one of the great benefits of leaving money to beneficiaries is they don't have to worry about a tax hit. They just they can take out what they need, keep the rest growing. They can take it all out if they wanted to. Uh, in most cases, that's not a great idea because uh, if you leave the money in the Roth, it can continue to grow with that tax deferral. Uh, but yeah, there's no tax to anybody once it gets into a Roth. That's the great benefit. Fabulous. Okay. Uh, when I turn 59 and a half this year, can I start withdrawing from my tax deferred 401k to pay the taxes now while the percentage is lower than reinvest the funds in something like a Roth IRA? Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So once you hit 59 and a half, uh, just to add to this question, once you hit 59 and a half, that removes the penalty for withdrawing. So if you're if you're younger than 59 and a half and you take money out of a traditional IRA or 401k, you also get hit with a 10% early withdrawal penalty. So in this question, once you turn 59 and a half, could you take money out and then reinvest it in a Roth IRA? Yes. The important point is uh, it's not a take the money out and then do a Roth contribution. It's actually doing a direct conversion from the traditional over to a Roth. So really the money's not supposed to come to you. There's some rules where you can do a, a rollover. You can get a check and you have a certain amount of time to, mm -hmm. to move it over. But just in general, uh, that can be kind of a mess. So mm -hmm. I recommend, you know, just take it directly from that traditional IRA or traditional 401k over to a Roth. And like we talked about earlier, if you're over 59 and a half, you can start doing that in small pieces just based on your tax bracket. Got it. Uh, I hope that answers that question well. Let's see, yeah, uh, let's, I think so. 
Okay. Um, somebody, so there's actually a follow-up to that question. Okay. Um, what other options do we have for after-tax investment vehicles? I realize there will be taxes on those capital gains, but not the initial principal. Sure, sure. So there are, uh, there are a couple of different options. Uh, one is you can use uh, an annuity. And a lot of people think of an annuity as you put money in and then you get a stream of income payments. And that is one way to do it. Uh, there's also something that just is an investment annuity, effectively. They have some cost to them from the insurance company, but what you can do is you can put after-tax money in and it grows tax-deferred. And then to that point, you're only paying money on the gain as you're taking that money out. So uh, there's more options on that now that have helped lower the cost. There are some companies that have come out with low-cost annuities that are just really meant uh, to be investments and have that uh, tax advantage, uh, but there's still some extra costs along th with that. It's not quite as good as a Roth IRA because you will pay some tax on on those gains. Uh, the other one that's out there for after tax money is just permanent life insurance. Um, we're not going to cover that here today, uh, but that's one way. It, permanent life insurance doesn't really have the high growth rates, but it, it has some pretty steady growth. So if you're okay with so lower growth rates, but not having a whole lot of volatility and still getting the tax benefits. Uh, that's one option as well. Cool. Um, someone asked, can I contribute to both IRA and 401k? Yes, yes, absolutely. There's no, uh, those are two completely different buckets, two different vehicles uh, with their own separate rules. You could absolutely do both. Cool. Um, Let's see, so how do you know which service to choose, a financial planner um, or a CPA? I know you're a CPA, how do you choose? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I'm both, so I'm, I'll have a little bit of bias here. Uh, so a CPA will typically um, focus on now. Uh, not as many CPAs do long-term planning. Uh, so that's where a financial planner will really help. And I, being both a CFP and a CPA, and having that view of, all right, how do we do the planning and how do we do the taxes at the same time? Uh, even if you're using two separate people, make sure that they talk to each other because mm -hmm. the CPA is really more focused on right now, um, mm -hmm. maybe next year, but usually not much beyond that, whereas a planner is really thinking longer term. Uh, but there's also a lot of planners that don't deal with taxes and understand all that in detail. So if you're going to use two different people, make sure they're talking. Uh, that's personally one of my big frustrations is when uh, you see there are two parties there and they're both trying to help, but they're not coordinating for, I don't know what reason. So that's really the difference is a lot of times CPA is gonna be a little more short-term focused, uh, planner's gonna be a little bit more long-term focused and they just need to connect. And that's, that's why I like doing both at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Um, what about using shorts like SH that shorts the S&P 500 as a hedge? Yeah, good question. So a lot of times we will just use, uh, so I'll put it this way. So there are funds out there that uh, will short the market. It Because you'll see like, you know, 3X bear QQQs or 3X bear SPY or something like that. Mm -hmm. the, the challenge is those rebalance quite often and it's hard to know what they're actually doing. So I don't, when you really look under the hood, they don't always do what they're supposed to do or what you would think they do. Uh, but instead, by using puts, you get a direct correlation between, okay, the, the S&P 500 or, the, or the, the NASDAQ Qs, they went down so much, okay? Well, the option is going to go up by a certain amount and you can actually see exactly what that would be. Um, and, it, and that's always gonna depend on volatility levels. But um, the reason I like using puts instead of just short funds and sometimes those short funds uh, like i said they just don't do it they can work a little bit but they don't always do exactly what you think they might do based on how they rebalance um, daily or weekly so i hope that answers that because those short funds get a little bit complex and there's not as uh not as transparent or easy to understand as i think they maybe should be okay but that's a good question okay um someone asked can i open more than one Roth IRA, only putting away 6,000 a year is nearly enough in 10 years. Um, you can open multiple accounts. There's no great reason to do that, but the total dollar limit is still the same. 
So if you open three accounts and put in $2,000 into each, it's still the same limit. It's not based on number of accounts, it's just based on you. Um, so yeah, so no, no great reason to open multiple uh, Roth IRAs though. So. Okay. so that's part of why we talk about doing the conversions to get the money into the Roth, because like you said, if you do 60,000 over, or excuse me, 6,000 over 10 years, that's $60,000. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, for some people, that's not a big enough dollar amount to maybe make as much of a difference as they'd like. That's why we talk about doing the conversions and going ahead and paying the tax now. I call it getting that mortgage off. It's really, mm -hmm. you know, if you have a million dollars sitting in a traditional IRA, that might sound great, but you don't actually have a million dollars. You have a million dollars minus the taxes you're going to pay. Mm -hmm. So let's, we'll focus on those Roth conversions over time to help decrease your tax over the long term. Mm -hmm. Let's see. That looks like the same question. How do the let's see? How do the gains of investing in the Roth IRA impact on the taxes? For example, gains of stock investment. Yep. Yep. Easy answer. That there's no tax. So if, so if you have stock sitting in a Roth IRA and it goes up um, and you sell it. There's no tax impact whatsoever. That's that's the really nice part about Roth IRAs and why I mm -hmm. I push them so hard. I don't I don't get crazy about them because there are some planning steps that you have to do and make sure that it's all done properly. And like I said, you don't want to put yourself into high tax brackets now. But mm -hmm. um, in general, I mean, it's just with the dynamics that we have now and the low tax rates, yeah, yeah, Roth is just a great way to go for all these reasons. Got it. Um, let's see, you talked a little bit about this, but maybe you could give us a little more. What is your view on annuities in the context of tax liability mitigation? Yep, yeah, yeah. so that's really, um, that's, I feel like that's a place where people go to after you're done with Roth. So, you know, from a tax perspective, and honestly, just from an investment perspective, Roth is probably the best way to go. Um, but that's where annuities can help supplement that if, if for some reason you have maxed out your Roth contributions or you're not eligible for Roth contributions and you're really maxed out on what you can do for a conversion and you're looking for yet another place to put money and not have it be taxed, uh, an annuity can help with that because if you take $100,000 and put it into a, an annuity contract that's investment focused, uh, all, any gains in that account are deferred uh, while it's in that annuity contract. So. Uh, it's not fully non-taxable, but you're still getting some tax benefits. So that's really the next layer on top of all this is once you're done with Roth contributions, Roth conversions, um, then that's really where you want to look to annuities, perhaps if you're doing it simply from a tax benefit perspective. Uh, the only, not the only, but one of the downsides to doing annuities is sometimes the, uh, the investment vehicles are a little bit more limited. Um, it's getting better. Um, but if it's in a taxable account, you'll be taxed on those things, but at the same time, you might be able to get more growth and invest in a lot more different investment vehicles. So you're going to have to weigh, all right, am I, how much do I really need to reduce taxes versus uh, what investment options do I have access to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So those are all the questions we have for today. Did you have other things you'd like to share? No, that was great. Those were good questions. I very much appreciate those. I think that helped clarify a lot of things because we try to stuff as much as we can in, uh -huh. in 30 minutes and really, really give people the important pieces on getting protection in your retirement accounts and getting it into a Roth IRA. And th those are some critical steps. Uh, there's always lots more details to cover, but those just getting those concepts and understanding that um, is critically important. But I like those questions. Those were great to clarify. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks, Dave. I appreciate you uh, taking the time with us to do this and teach us all about these exciting details of, man, I never knew that investments and taxes and retirement could be uh, that interesting. You kept me, you kept me engaged. Um, and thanks to all the participants who came here to learn with us today. Um, you can expect an email from us um, shortly. It will include the recording, a replay of what you just heard and saw. Um, and then feel free to share that replay with, you know, anyone that you think might benefit the material that was shared here today. Um, have a great afternoon and thanks again for your time and attention. And thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. Bye, everybody. Let's see.